My name is uh, Lawrence Anholt and um, I'm a writer and an artist. Uh, I trained originally as a, as a painter, so I had a, a quite conventional uh, painting background. I did a degree at um, Falmouth School of Art in Cornwall and I did a master's degree at the Royal Academy in London. So I trained as a painter. My background is in, in fine art really, uh, but I moved uh, probably 20, 28 or 29 years ago. I moved into children's books with my wife Catherine and we've done that ever since. Well, I mean, that's really hard to say. One of the series that I've worked on most consistently over the years is a series about great artists. And when I'm working on, the, on those illustrations, then I'm obviously looking at the artist. And with each of those books, I'm, there's a kind of a nod towards the artist in, in the style. So uh, I never copy something absolutely directly. But yeah, I'm influenced by, by the artist for sure, yeah. Well, um, so the series that I do, which is called the Anholtz Artist Series, um, there are ten books in the series, and about half of them, the artist is in copyright, Matisse, Picasso and Chagall, uh, and then the other half, the artist is out of copyright, so Van Gogh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, so that makes a difference. Yeah, there are a number of factors when I'm choosing an artist uh, to work on. I mean, really what I'm looking for is a story, but there, there, there are a lot of factors. Each of those books has a real child as the protagonist. That's the device that I use in the stories. So each of them is a story about a great artist, but it's also a story about a real child who knew the artist. So first of all, I've got to find that story. I've got to find the real child who knew the artist. That's a really important factor. Um, and then uh, the American publishers are very influential, so it's got to be an artist that's well known in America as well as in the UK, so that's another important factor. But yeah, there's a lot of discussion with the publisher about which artist I'm going to do next. And Well, you know, I think it's very important in the series that I am creating books that are about artists like Picasso, for example. I mean, any history of art, whether it's for children or for adults, uh, would be incomplete without covering artists like Picasso. So, in a way, I've got to. And, and, and besides anything else, I love those artists. They really excite me. But the difficulty is, yeah, then I've got to find my way through, through the copyright jungle, and that's, uh, that's difficult, yeah. I find my way through the copyright jungle with the assistance of um, some really good advice from my publishers. Um, I've got someone there who's a, a rights specialist who spends a lot of time making contact with the Picasso administration or the Chagall family or whoever it is uh, and we're constantly um, in touch with those people and, and, tr and trying to get permission. Some of it might do myself. It's amazing uh, as an artist or a writer just writing a personal letter to a relative uh, of an artist can make all the difference and then I can get uh, permission directly like that. So that sometimes happens. Sometimes the personal touch is more helpful than trying to do things in a, uh, in a legal way. I think it would be very difficult. I mean, it's an absolute minefield, uh, copyright law, and I think you really need to have some kind of copyright training. But um, uh, I think in, in the first instance, as I said, it can be very helpful for me just to make some kind of personal contact with someone. But I mean, there have been instances where I've got quite far down the line and then uh, the whole thing's shut down. Uh, it's been refused and, and I've had to turn around and, and, and come back again, yeah. I think it's really important for artists and writers to know about copyright. I think it's really important for a number of reasons. One of the things is that um, you know, we all cherish our own copyright on our own work. We don't want people exploiting our work and so it's only fair that we have an understanding of it so that we don't inadvertently steal from other artists ourselves. So yeah, I think we're all in it together and, and it's about fairness as much as anything else. I mean, I just don't like stealing work from other people. I think it's unethical, so uh, that's important for me.
Well, the, the, the benefit of using out of copyright work is that you have complete freedom. It's something that's in the public domain. You have the freedom to use it as you want to, to reinvent it. And I think when something's out of copyright, then it becomes part of our sort of general cultural heritage, which is a, a wonderful thing. It's, it's something that we all take for granted. But any one of us, any creative person at any time is, is dipping into that great big pool of our cultural heritage. I think we're all influenced by what's gone in in the past. Nobody is completely uh, completely original uh, and so to be able to dip into that and and use ideas very freely is what artists do I mean the greatest artist Picasso uh, was inspired by uh, many many artists uh, people he knew like Matisse and also African art and he was constantly uh, didn't he say something like uh, you know I don't borrow I steal he was quite open about it uh, I don't steal uh, deliberately but uh, yeah we're all influenced and there's, there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that what I think is wrong is when you uh, when you when something's done in a hidden way if you plagiarize uh, work from another artist and you pass it off as your own uh, then I think you've passed a an ethical or a moral boundary and uh, and that's just simply not right so this is a series of books uh, which are an introduction to great artists for very young children um, so they're books about great artists like Van Gogh, Picasso, Degas, Leonardo da Vinci there are nine books in the series right now and the thing about them that's a little bit different is each of them tells a story about a child who knew the artist and in each book it's a real child so they're based on pretty rigorous research so I have to find who the actual child was uh, in my book um, Camille and the Sunflowers um, the little boy Camille was a real boy he was the son of the postman in Arles who knew Van Gogh and so it's all based on heavy research um, in my book about Degas it's the story of the little dancer and um, so you have to quite often there's masses of information about the artist but not so much information about the child so it leads you on some pretty interesting detective chases to try and find out who these children were what happened with the first book was I was working as a school teacher and I was telling the kids stories about artists and I found that they were responding to anecdotes and stories about the artists more than facts and figures and around about the time I was thinking about children's publishing my wife Catherine had been doing some children's books and I took the first book uh, Camille and the Sunflowers to a publisher Francis Lincoln and I said do you think this would make a children's book they liked it and it kind of grew from there so what I have now is a fair fairly standard um, relationship between I'm an author and an illustrator, I write and illustrate those books, and my publisher, my UK publisher Francis Lincoln, and then beyond that I've got the American publishers, and then those books are published into about 15 languages, uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese is, is, is very good, and they've gone all over the world. They sell more in museums and gallery bookshops and into schools than in mainstream bookshops, but they've been going for more than 25 years now and they've done really really well in, in, lot, in lots of uh, different formats. Yeah the first book in the series was about Van Gogh and um, at the time I really don't think I understood anything about copyright. It hadn't crossed my mind that copyright uh, didn't apply to Van Gogh, that Van Gogh was out of copyright. Of course that was very fortuitous, it would have been very difficult if I'd have started with Picasso. I started with Van Gogh because I'm half Dutch myself, Van Gogh's an artist that I've always loved, so it was a passion thing really more than anything else, but um, that's the reason I started with the Van Gogh book. So when the series got rolling, then I got interested in doing artists like uh, Matisse and Picasso and most recently Chagall. These artists are in copyright. And so that meant that we had to get the consent of the Picasso administration or the Picasso family. Uh, and it was very, very tricky indeed. Um, with the Picasso uh, estate, uh, that was particularly difficult because uh, I believe I'm right in saying that Claude and Paloma were at the time personally involved with what they allowed and what they didn't allow. 
But my story was about a, 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 a girl called Sylvette David, who has become a friend of mine. She's now in her 60s. She knew Picasso very well back in the 1950s. And we were able to use that personal family connection to kind of help us in. I think without that, it would have been impossible. But even so, it was difficult. And um, the Picasso uh, estate had, uh, had first uh, view of every illustration I did. And I had to do that book again and again and again and again. And even then, at the end of it, um, they took a, a royalty, and they still continue to take a royalty uh, on that now. And the same is true of the Matisse book. Uh, yeah, so very difficult. I'm very cautious about doing artists who are in copyright. Uh, it's much easier to do an artist who's out of copyright, and I think my publishers share that. It's a lot of hassle for them to get consent to, uh, to do books about artists who are in copyright. But having said that, in the end, you've got to do a book that you feel passionate about, that's really going to work. You've got to find a really good story. So that, that counts for more for me. Right. So right now, for example, I'm looking at doing the next book in the series. And the two artists that my publishers like, um, the two fine artists, are Vermeer, uh, you know, obviously the girl with the pearl earring, uh, and Frida Kahlo. Now my choice is Frida Kahlo because she's a woman artist, because I find her work very exciting, because I think children would be engaged by her work. There's a kind of feminist angle, there's all kinds of interesting stuff in there. I've also found a child who knew Frida Kahlo. So, so I think I'm going to persuade the publishers that that's the artist we should be doing, even though it's going to cost us money to do that, whereas Vermeer would be essentially free except for reuse of the re uh, reproductions of the paintings. But yeah, so essentially I'm going to go for Frida Kahlo even though she is in copyright. So the way it works as, a, as an author illustrator is that um, the rights on my, on my books, the books that I've created, are shared with the publisher. So, you know, you get a 30 page contract essentially uh, and within that there are various rights that are held retained by me and various rights that are held by the publishers. And it's, it's quite complex, but I mean this is absolutely standard really. You know, you work a, as a partnership with your publisher, so it's only right that they... So for example with my artist series, I believe I'm right in saying that the, that the uh, publishers have um, control over the generic series, but I own each individual book. They have rights over what the covers look like and how it's marketed but the story within it belongs to me. So it's quite complex and um, I'm not a lawyer, so I have to get advice on this. I work without an agent, unlike most authors, but I use uh, the Society of Authors in the UK, which is like a trade union for authors and illustrators. In incredibly good organisation. They're really, really helpful on giving advice. And so far, I've never run into any problems. I've never got into disputes with my publishers. So the books are in their 25th year, I think, and um, they've sold, uh, I mean, I think several of the books in the series have sold over a million copies uh, worldwide, certainly the, the Van Gogh one. Um, and uh, obviously what the author receives is quite a small percentage of that. There's quite a lot of people that have to take a slice of that pie, including the publisher, including the booksellers, and including, um, in the case of the Picasso books, the, uh, the copyright holder, the Picasso administration, whoever it is. So what the author actually receives is, is, is quite a small um, slice of the pie. But, you know, I've been doing books a long time, I've done over 200 books, and it adds up, it adds up. So eventually you've got lots of books that are in print, some books that are out of print, but one way or another it's a very, very decent living and I'm very grateful and I feel very blessed to be make, able to make a living as a, as a creative artist. It's interesting actually because I've had experience of, of both sides of the art world. As I said, I trained originally as a fine artist and I wanted, I dreamed as a youngster of making my living as a painter. I wanted to be <laughs> Picasso or Van Gogh, so it's quite ironic that I'm actually making a living out of writing children's books about those artists. But I just found right away, as soon as I had children and a mortgage, that it was going to be very, very difficult in the UK to make a living as a fine artist. So I took a sideways step into producing uh, children's books and I found I loved it anyway. And I do my own painting now, but I do it just purely for, for pleasure. 
Uh, I have a son who's a fine artist and um, he's making a very good living just selling his paintings, but he's doing it in Berlin and in Copenhagen and not in the UK. And I think it's very, very much easier in those places than it is, it is here. So when you're talking about, uh, it's, this is so funny to talk in this way because you know I do think of myself as a creative person and not as a businessman as such. But having said that, you know this is this is a job. I'm a professional. I do make a living out of it. So yeah, there are all of these different income streams associated with producing children's books. Okay, so with the artist series, I'm both author and illustrator. So in fact, I'm earning probably twice the royalties that I would be if I was just the writer or just the illustrator. So that's a big advantage. Um, then the books are published into, into lots of different languages and I'm getting a royalty from each of those countries. Uh, so that's a very good thing. And then on top of that, there are lots of other um, a, a little revenue streams. For example, in the UK, we have a thing called PLR, Public Lending Rights, which is just fantastic. It basically means that every time someone takes one of your books out of public out of a public library. The author, a lot of people don't realise this, libraries are free, but in actual fact the author is being paid a very modest amount on every loan of their book. Now, oh, oh, when you have a lot of books in print, I mean, that's fantastic, it builds up. There's a ceiling on it. You, I think the ceiling is um, um, it, it's not massive, but my wife and myself probably make £12,000 a year and have done for 20 years. And, and, and um, you know, in the early years, that was absolutely fantastic to have that solid income uh, coming in from um, uh, libraries. And then on top of that, you've got um, ALCS, which is the Authors, Authors License and Collecting Society, uh, and, um, and DAX and various other things, so that when my books are used for photocopying right across Europe, taken from libraries in Holland and various other countries, you're going to get getting a revenue stream from that. In theory, if somebody photocopies uh, from your work and they declare it, you get a small payment on that. If an article is written about your work in a, in a, in a magazine, you get a small payment from that. Uh, if books are adapted into, um, into film, into um, animation, um, uh, in, and in many other ways, stage productions, obviously you're getting a revenue from that. And then there are numerous other little things, merchandising um, and all kinds of bits and pieces. Uh, and then other things where you waive the royalty, so adaptations for the blind or, or you know, for the visually impaired uh, and, and so on. But um, overall, all of these things add up and so although you would struggle to make a living out of just one book, it adds up to a very, very decent way of making a living. That's exactly right. Those revenue streams only work if there is a, a, a rigorous copyright uh, structure in place because this this depends on people, school teachers, people that going into uh, places and being fair, respecting copyright laws and saying it's only fair that I pay just a few few pence, just a few whatever it is. It's only fair because I've used something uh, and and I'm dependent on that whole system and and the, and the fairness and and people not cheating it. So the main thing I think that authors are dependent on is that a publisher will pay an advance up front. So they're taking a gamble on your book actually working and so they pay you a lump sum for the time that it takes you to create that book and that's an advance that's held against royalties. So essentially you pay that back with your royalties and when that advance is paid off that's when you actually start to, to make the royalties. But um, it's those, those big chunks that actually make it viable. So alongside your twice yearly royalties you're getting several advances for new books each year and so that all adds up to um, a decent income. But It's a really hard uh, question to answer. That's a really hard question to answer because the two things are absolutely intertwined. I mean, uh, yes, the books that are about Picasso, that are about Matisse, uh, a, a small sum is, is going to the uh, Picasso administration. Whether or not that actually affects my royalty, I don't know. Perhaps it does marginally. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing to say. I mean, on the other hand, you could say that because Picasso is such a popular artist that um, uh, that's actually helping with the sales of the book. So I would personally find it impossible to pick those two things apart. 
Well, the one, the one thing I can tell you, uh, which is quite interesting, is that some of the adaptations that have been of my books, uh, for example, there have been a few animations. There was a, a big um, uh, stage musical in Korea of my Van, Van Gogh book, uh, absolutely fantastic. And in those cases, the creative people behind it, the animators, the, um, the producers of the stage productions, did not want to go near the uh, Picasso or the Matisse uh, books because they just thought it would be way too difficult so they could quite freely get in there and and, and uh, produce a wonderful stage production about Van Gogh uh, it looked absolutely fantastic and they were completely free to do that so so it has held me back in in some ways uh, doing artists that uh, are in copyright Yeah, so the availability of out of copyright work for the series was was really really important. I mean, it's actually a joy to work on an artist like uh, like Van Gogh who's out of copyright because it gives you just so much freedom. But having said that, in each of the books, I have actual little reproductions of. Van Goghs or Degas or whatever they are, and of course we have to uh, pay to to use those because those uh, those paintings are actually owned by a museum or a gallery or they're in a private collection, so we have to pay a fee for that. Um, but beyond that, I have complete freedom to tell the story as I want to. Yeah. I think the point about it is that for the books you need really, really good quality, high resolution, and it's much better to do it with the with the consent of the gallery that owns the uh, that owns the painting. It's much better. You pay it. You pay a small fee. I don't know exactly how much it is. In, in actual fact, it's my publishers that pay it. It's not me. And then if you do it with the consent of the gallery, then that's absolutely fantastic because the other thing about it is that's an incentive then then for them to stock the book in their bookshop and you get this lovely relationship going. So it's much better to do that than just to lift the image from uh, Wikipedia or something. So wherever possible, I like to do things above, above board, yeah. I think that when I started doing this series, it was the only uh, series of its kind. And now there are several other um, children's books about uh, artists. Uh, there's a very popular one about Monet, for example, uh, called Linear in Monet's Garden. Um, and uh, an, uh, I, there's an author I know who's a kind of personal friend of mine called James Mayhew, who did a book called Katie and the Sunflowers. And we <laughs> given up arguing about who was first. And listen, who cares? You know, it's a big world. There are a lot of children out there. I make a very decent living out of it. That's absolutely fine. He's not copying me in any way. He loves Van Gogh. I love Van Gogh. I don't think there's any kind of a problem about that so I'm perfectly happy about it. If someone directly copied my series I, then I would be unhappy about it. It did happen once actually um, and it was a, quite a strange story. My um, American publisher felt that I was producing uh, stories too slowly. They take a long time because of all the research. So what they did was they commissioned a couple of art artists and writers to produce their own book, but they were in exactly the same style and fitted into my series. In other words, they were books. My books are unique because they have a real child in the story, and they did exactly the same thing about some artists that I hadn't tackled. Now, I was really unhappy about that, and they couldn't understand why I was upset. And I thought it was a breach of trust, really. I, I don't think it was a copyright issue, but I wrote to them, and I was unhappy about that. And they were very decent about it, and they promised not to do it again, and uh, they really did understand why I should be upset. So that essential little idea of doing a book about a great artist through the eyes of a real child who knew the artist, that's my idea. And if someone else did that in a very specific way, then I might be a little bit upset about it. I think there are people who are doing it now about um, musicians and so on and so forth. And you know, listen, there's no point in getting kind of paranoid about these things. Uh, you, you know, it just gets you upset. So there's no point in doing that. And I've been very blessed to earn a very good living out of it. So you've got to have a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of freedom. And, and in the end, you know, I'd say the final thing, it's about fairness, it's about treating other people decently. You know, the laws are great, they help you, but in the end you treat people the way that you would treat a friend or somebody in your family. And I think if more people did that, then everything would be fair and everything would work out.
I don't think that's true. I don't think that, um, I mean, you could, I mean, I suppose with things that have become uh, kind of icons, like the Mona Lisa, you know, we're not able to look at them in a fresh way anymore. So I suppose that's absolutely true. But uh, um, no, essentially, um, I, you know, I believe in both things. I believe that there should be copyright laws. I think it's really important to uh, protect the work of people who are, who are living at any rate. I think that's really important. And I think beyond that, when things go into the public domain, then I think it's very important that they are shared and that they are there for everybody. So I think uh, both sides of the argument are valid. I mean, I, I, as a creative person, I want my work to be uh, protected. I don't want to sit for a year creating a work of art and then somebody, as you can do now, just literally um, at the touch of a mouse uh, send it out to the whole world and make money out of it. I don't want that. Who wants that? Uh, so I want it to be protected in, in, in some kind of a way. But also there is something beyond that, which is this wonderful uh, archive that we all share as human beings, which goes back, you know, thousands of years before lawyers were even invented. You know, uh, stories. I mean, I do another series for children, uh, which are adaptations, funny adaptations of kind of Grimm's fairy stories. And I love that, reaching back into uh, architecture Type or folk stories and fairy stories, and um, uh, to have that pool, that resource there, is is part of what makes it, uh, being human rich and uh, makes you feel alive as a human being. Is our shared creative culture. What I couldn't say to you is, you know, exactly whether it should be 70 years or 90 years or, or whatever it is. I sometimes think it's a little bit peculiar that the great 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 grandson or granddaughter of a particular person is able to live, you know, a life of prosperity uh, on, on something that their ancestor created many, many years ago. I sometimes, I sometimes wonder about that. Or more often, some kind of organisation, some great organisation is, is making money out of it. And sometimes those people are quite mean about sharing that, uh, that, that gift that the artist left. Um, so yeah, I think there are issues around that. But um, I think that definitely for artists who are alive, their work should be protected. No, no question about that.